So welcome everybody, it's Patrick McKeown here and what I want to do is I want to discuss how can you breathe or change your breathing patterns in order to make wearing a mask easier. Um, there's a lot of information about wearing masks. Some people are talking about as you're breathing into the mask, pulling carbon dioxide, it's increasing carbon dioxide to dangerously high levels in the blood. Um, it's also contributing what people are saying to hypoxia. And I just want to talk about that. I want to talk about the gas carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is not just a waste gas. Um, you know, it's really very fundamental in human life. And discovered back in 1904 is, was by a Danish physiologist called Christian Bohr. And it's called the Bohr effect. And that's B-O-H-R. And basically that the pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood is a catalyst for the release of oxygen from the red blood cells to the tissues. Now, too often we hear that oxygen is good and that carbon dioxide is bad. It's not just quite as simple as that. So when you take a breath of air into your lungs, oxygen transfers from your lungs into the blood, and the majority of oxygen is carried in the blood by hemoglobin molecules. And as I said, the catalyst for the release of oxygen from the red blood cells to the tissues and organs, including the brain, is carbon dioxide. Now, atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide are about, about 0.04% of the atmosphere, so they're very, very low. And the concentration of carbon dioxide in your blood is 5%. So it kind of gives you an idea that the human body needs a concentration of carbon dioxide that's far beyond what's contained in the atmosphere. Now, when you breathe with a mask, any mask, um, and especially a mask that's well tight-fitting, and um, if there's difficulty in particles escaping, of course it's going to pull carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide will increase, but it's not going to increase to dangerously high levels because you are literally breathing out carbon dioxide from the, from the lungs, from the blood through the lungs. The CO2 that's coming out, of, out on your breath is going to be about 5% of atmospheric pressure or 40 millimeters of mercury. It's not dangerously high. That's what's already in your blood. It's in the arterial blood. Now, how might you feel? Um, the problem with wearing the mask is the feeling of discomfort. And discomfort is because of the air hunger that's generated by wearing the mask. So as carbon dioxide is collecting and pooling inside of the mask and you are rebreathing that carbon dioxide back into your lungs, you're feeling air hunger. The, how you respond to the feeling of air hunger will depend on individual to individual. Some individuals, with, for example, if they are prone to panic disorder, if they are prone to anxiety, if they are prone to asthma, if they are prone to breathing problems, if they have a breathing pattern disorder, and also females during the luteal phase of the monthly cycle when progesterone levels are high, they can have an increased sensitivity to the buildup of carbon dioxide. So it depends on genetic predispositions, it depends on your background, and for females, it can depend on the monthly cycle. It's very important in good health anyway to reduce your body's sensitivity to carbon dioxide. So what I would say is when you're wearing a mask and if you have to wear a mask as part of your workplace, don't launch into wearing a mask for three, four hours straight. Start with 15, 20 minutes. And not only about breathing while wearing the mask, and I will go through how to breathe while wearing the mask to reduce air hunger, but also to improve alveolar ventilation. It's also vital to have your mouth closed and breathe only through your nose during physical exercise, during walking, during rest, and during sleep. And the reason being, if you continuously breathe through your nose, it can help to improve and reduce your sensitivity to carbon dioxide buildup. So therefore, when you wear a mask, it will be easier to tolerate. Now, in terms of oxygen, you will read reports that blood oxygen saturation is dropping when people are wearing a mask. And I'd just like to shed some light on that. Number one, in terms of, it takes quite a lot of work, just I'm put, just muting everybody. It takes quite a reduction in airflow to drop blood oxygen saturation. The feeling of air hunger that you experience while wearing a mask is not because oxygen is dropping, because the primary stimulus to breathe is carbon dioxide. That feeling of air hunger that you experience while wearing a mask is an accumulation of carbon dioxide. Now, I already said that as carbon dioxide increases 
in the blood. It causes what's called the right shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. But basically, hemoglobin releases oxygen in the presence of carbon dioxide. And as a result, it will show as a lowering in your SpO2. But that's not necessarily bad. So when you're thinking of SpO2 or SaO2, you're talking about how fully loaded are the red blood cells with oxygen. And uh, hemoglobin is the main carrier of oxygen. It's a protein um, within the red blood cells. It's the main carrier of oxygen. And in the presence of carbon dioxide, hemoglobin releases oxygen more readily. And this will show in a drop to your SpO2. But you have to bear in mind that the reason that there's a drop in your blood oxygen saturation is because your hemoglobin is releasing oxygen more readily to the tissues and organs. So don't see the drop in SpO2 as being bad. Um, because, you know, for example, I'll have you do a couple of breathing exercises whereby we'll purposely create air hunger. And if you, wearing, if you were wearing pulse oximetry during this time, you will see that your blood oxygen saturation will hardly drop at all. That that feeling of air hunger is due to carbon dioxide buildup. Okay. Your ability to tolerate your mask is going to be influenced in part by your breath hold time. And your breath hold time, we call a bolt in the oxygen advantage. And basically, your breath hold time gives you feedback of your body's chemosensitivity <clears throat> to carbon dioxide. Now, to measure your breath hold time, what I would like you to do is you're sitting down for about five minutes. Take a normal breath in through your nose, a normal breath out through your nose, and pinch your nose with your fingers. And you're timing it in seconds until you feel the first definite desire to breathe. And when you feel the first definite desire to breathe, let go and breathe. And your breathing should be fairly normal. The measurement that you get there provides feedback of the degree of how well you breathe. And a paper by Professor Kiesel, a professor in physical therapy that was published in 2018, looking at 51 subjects, he used the bowl score, the description of the bowl score, same as the control pose in the Buteyko method. His conclusion was, if you have a bowl score of greater than 25 seconds, there is an 89% chance that dysfunctional breathing is not present. Now, what does bowl score measure? Bowl score measures your degree of breathlessness, dyspnea, how fast you breathe. And it typically provides feedback of how, if you're breathing using the upper chest, or if you're breathing fast versus slow. So as your bowl score increases, you are more likely to breathe low using the diaphragm. And as your bowl score increases, your respiratory rate is typically slower. So people with a low bowl score, if they have a bowl score of 10 seconds, they have a stronger chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide buildup. When, we, when they wear a mask and they are pooling carbon dioxide and rebreathing that gas back into the lungs, which is going to increase carbon dioxide in the blood, that they will have a stronger reaction in terms of air hunger. So remember, it's carbon dioxide that is the primary stimulus to breed, and the feeling of air hunger that you, you feel when you're wearing the mask is because of the buildup of carbon dioxide. However, we need to reduce the body's chemosensitivity or sensitivity to carbon dioxide. We need to make the body more tolerant to carbon dioxide. And actually, that's good. There is a reason that we have athletes train with masks on. And the reason being is because we use masks to expose them to higher carbon dioxide, to reduce their body's chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide, so that when they do physical exercise, they have less breathlessness. Okay, so when you are, so my whole point here is that it's your everyday breathing and your bolt score that's going to influence um, the feeling of air hunger. So when you wear the mask, I would say don't launch into wearing the mask for a long period of time, but expose your body gently to it and the pooling of carbon dioxide and rebreathing it in. If you do use pulse oximetry, just to realize that the drop in your blood oxygen saturation is not necessarily because of the, 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 you know, the restriction to breathing in terms of bringing oxygen in, because the masks are pretty porous. And you'll also find that there's probably going to be, it's not going to be tightly sealed. It's not a mask like this. You know, it's not a mask whereby it's completely tight again. So there's plenty of room for air to come in. Um, and there is pooling of carbon dioxide. So the drop that you witness to your blood oxygen saturation 
can be due to a right shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve due to an increase of carbon dioxide, a drop to blood pH. In other words, hemoglobin releases oxygen and from the blood to the tissues. In other words, your tissues are getting more oxygen, but in the blood, the SpO2 is showing as being lower. And as I said, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I'd like you just to practice this in terms of learning and understanding about carbon dioxide. If you put one hand on your chest and put one hand just above your navel, and I would like you to tune into your breathing. And if you've got panic disorder, just go very gentle with it. But otherwise, it's pretty safe for everybody. So I would like you to tune into the airflow coming into your nose and to tune into the airflow as it's leaving your nose and to really feel the airflow as it's coming into your nose and to feel the airflow as it's leaving your nose. And as you're breathing, what I would like you to do is to gently slow down the speed of the air coming into your nose and at the top of the breath, bring a total feeling of relaxation to the body and have a relaxed and gentle breath out. The objective here is that when you're feeling the airflow coming into your nose, I would like you to breathe less air. I would like you to slow down your breathing sufficiently to the point that you feel a hunger for air. I want you to simulate the effects of air hunger that you will experience while wearing the mask. And I want you to do it for about three to four minutes. So I need you to feel slightly breathless, slight air hunger, a need that you would like to take in a bigger breath, but don't give in to that. I want you to purposely underbreed to allow carbon dioxide to accumulate in the blood because it's not leaving the blood so readily. And we want to test what's happening to the body when you breathe less air. When you breathe slightly less air, what happens in terms of blood flow, what I, in terms of circulation, in terms of oxygen delivery, and also in terms of relaxation of the mind. So even though you're feeling a little bit of an air hunger, what are the effects there? And it's not about being panicked. So again, you're focusing on the airflow coming into your nose. You're really feeling the airflow coming into your nose. You're slowing down the speed of your breath and at the top of the breath, bring a total feeling of relaxation to the body and allow a relaxed and gentle breath out. The objective is that your breathing now is less than what it was before you started. I need you to hide your breathing. I need you to take about 30% less air into your body. How do you take 30% less air into your body? Really slow down the speed of air coming into your nose. Can you slow down your breathing so much, almost that the fine hairs within the nostrils do not move, almost that you feel hardly, hardly any turbulence coming into your nose, that your breathing is so light? and deliberately expose yourself to that air hunger, and then check what is happening to your body as a result of the air hunger. The objective is not to feel stressed, the objective is not to feel panicked, but the objective is to feel that you would like to take in a bigger breath. So again, you're just gently focusing on the airflow coming into your nose, you're really slowing down the speed of the air coming into your nose, and at the top of the breath, a total feeling of relaxation to the body, that you have a relaxed and prolonged breath out. And then when you feel the need to breathe in again, you take a very soft and slight breath in. So you're taking a really soft and slight and gentle breath in, deliberately under breathing, deliberately taking less air into your body, deliberately breathing less air to allow carbon dioxide to increase in the blood. And the body is very sensitive to a buildup of CO2. For example, a two to five millimeter increase of CO2 can double ventilation. So soften your breathing. Your breathing should be about 30% less than what it was. Hide your breathing. We should not see you breathing too much. Okay, so you can take a rest at that. Now, you were doing it correctly. There's a large volume, large group of people here. Um, it's 100 people, so I can't really, you know, ask you personal questions or anything like that. But you were doing it correctly if you feel our hunger. Now, generally, when people do that exercise, and this is one exercise that we practice in terms of improving the biochemistry of breathing. Generally, they notice that there's a, an improvement in the temperature of their hands, not just because you have the hands to your body, but internally, because it's very common for people who have dysfunctional breathing patterns to have cold hands and cold feet. <clears throat> the harder you breathe, the more you lose carbon dioxide from the blood through the lungs and the more your blood vessels constrict. So if you think of 70,000 miles of blood vessels throughout the body, 
you can have blood vessel constriction from breathing too hard. Now, I know that can fly in the face of the belief that's out there that it's good to be taking big breaths and deep breaths and the more air you breathe, the better. That is not correct. If you look at people who are not well, they typically have poor breathing. People with different conditions, people with chronic fatigue, people with asthma, people with COPD, people with diabetes. Um, when we have a problem with our health, it can manifest in our breathing. And if you look at an elite athlete, you will hardly see their breathing. Their breathing is undetectable. So as human beings, it's very important that we are efficient with our breathing. Now, what I would say is practice that exercise in the comfort of your own home. Don't worry if you're breathing chest or diaphragmatic when you're doing it. The whole purpose is just to tune into the biochemistry and that you are deliberately slowing down and softening the speed of your breathing to allow carbon dioxide to increase in the blood. And check what happens, your temperature of your fingers, check what happens to saliva in the mouth. For example, as human beings, when we get stressed, our mouth goes dry. So a dry mouth is often synonymous with stress that we're in that fight or flight response. And when you deliberately slow down your breathing, your mind is more anchored onto the breath because of the air hunger. But when you have air hunger, it signifies carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood and the increased carbon dioxide will increase blood flow to the brain. The increased carbon dioxide will increase blood flow throughout the body and the increased carbon dioxide will have a right shift, show a right shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve so more oxygen gets delivered. And this can have a calming effect on the central nervous system. Okay, so that's one aspect of breathing, looking at the biochemistry. Now, in terms of wearing the mask, when you're feeling air hunger, and especially if you have got a low bolt score, or as I said, like females are more prone to, this, to dysfunctional breathing patterns, much more than men. And especially females, um, say, below the ages of 46, 47, 48, 50 years of age. So when I'm talking about that, just if any females are listening, the, the weeks following ovulation before menstruation, progesterone levels can be increased and progesterone is a respiratory stimulant. And it can be during this time that your carbon dioxide levels drop by 25% due to, to the impact of the change of hormones. So during that time, your breathing will typically get faster. Your breathing will typically get more upper chest. Your heart rate can increase a little bit. Heart rate variability can drop. And you can be more prone to fatigue, to pain, um, to, to anxiety and to panic. Because when we hyperventilate and breathe too much air, um, the perception of pain increases and pain threshold lowers. So anybody who's in chronic pain Try not to breathe fast and shallow because it, it, doesn't, and it, you know, it doesn't help you and it's, it's only going to heighten your pain as opposed to gently slowing down your breathing, gently slowing down breathing. Now, if you're looking for more information on the effect of um, progesterone on, on breathing, look at the work by Leon Shato, who has been investigating this for about 50 years. Now, he's sadly passed on now, but in terms of women with fibromyalgia. They can be diagnosed with fibromyalgia dur during different times of the monthly cycle and not diagnosed at others. And it was primarily because of the change to hormones. It's very important, and we've seen it as well with people sending us emails, that when you practice slowing down your breathing, you help to negate some of the effects of hyperventilation. So my point is, when you're wearing a mask and it's quite restrictive and there's pulling of carbon dioxide, <coughs> there would be a natural tendency to breathe through the mouth and there would be a natural tendency to breathe fast and shallow. But the risk here is that it can cause you to breathe too hard and too much. To improve alveolar ventilation, the worst thing that you could do is breathe fast and shallow. And if you look at the work of the Italian cardiologist, Luciano Bernardi, he spoke about this. And the reason being is because every breath that you take so much air of that air, so much of that air remains in dead space. And if you breathe fast, so the name of the, the individual is Luciano Bernardi, and he's got about he's got about 500 papers on PubMed, and a lot of it he was a cardiologist in Italy, and he was using breathing exercises with his patients with chronic heart failure, 
he would see his patients with chronic heart failure and they had exercise intolerance. So they were breathing quite hard during physical exercise. And he asked the question, is it the chronic heart failure which is causing the exercise intolerance or do these individuals have an increased chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide? In other words, are they less tolerant to CO2 in the blood, CO2 accumulation? So we had them practice slowing down their breathing to six breaths per minute. And this in turn is helping to influence the autonomic nervous system. It stimulates the vagus nerve. It increases the sensitivity of the bioreceptors and improves functioning of the autonomic nervous system. But it also reduced breathlessness. It reduced dyspnea. So there are other papers looking at um, there are other papers looking at individuals climbing altitude. And what I might do is I might just try and pull up a couple of the papers. I was trying to log in here earlier on with this Zoom because it actually wouldn't let me log in. And that's why I had to shut the whole thing down to, to log in. And as a result, then I didn't have time to, um, to, get, to get my the papers ready. So I'm just going to pull up. This is the effects of slow, deep breathing at altitude. And I'm going to do a share screen. I think it's important to look at. Um, in terms of how can you breathe to improve and enhance alveolar ventilation. And I also want to show you how to, just in terms of the, the numbers in what's going on there. So if you just bear me one second. So I'm just looking at our first slide. Okay, so I'm going to do a share screen. And one moment, I'm just waiting for the, for the slide to appear. I'm going to put it onto a different screen here. So the first share screen that I'm looking at is this here. And this is looking at how can you breathe to improve alveolar ventilation? And what I'm talking about here is if, for example, you're wearing a mask and you're feeling air hunger and you're feeling that you're not getting enough air, there's a natural tendency for you to breathe fast and to breathe shallow because you want to alleviate that feeling of suffocation. Now, if you take 20 breaths of air into your body, whether it's through the nose or through the mouth, and if you're breathing shallow, that the size of each breath, the volume of each breath is, a, is 300 mil. This gives you a minute ventilation of six liters. So even though you're taking six liters of air into your body, how much of that air is actually got down into the alveoli to the small air sacs where gas exchange can take place? To find that out, we have to subtract dead space. This is the air that remains in the nasal cavity, in the throat, in the trachea, in the bronchi, in the bronchioles. So in this example here, we have an individual who is breathing fast and shallow. They're taking 20 breaths per minute. Their tidal volume is 300 mil. But when we subtract dead space, this is the air remaining in, in the conducting airways um, that's not reaching the small air sacs in the lungs where gas exchange can take place. You see in this instance that only three liters of air actually is getting down into the small air sac. So even though the individual is breathing six liters of air into their body. 50% of that air is wasted in dead space. It's wasted in the throat, the nasal cavity, the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles. Now, if you slow down the respiratory rate to 12 breaths per minute, and I, here in this example, I'm increasing the tidal volume to a half a liter. So the individual is still taking six liters of air per minute. But because the respiratory rate has dropped down to 12, there's less air loss to dead space. So you see already, by changing the respiratory rate, and also not by increasing minute ventilation, because you don't want to be hyperventilating. But in this example, we increased the amount of air that's getting down into the small air sacs from 3 liters to 4.2. Now, if we go one step further, down to 6 breaths per minute, that we really slow down the respiratory rate, and we allow the tidal volume, the size of each breath, to increase proportionately. We're still taking six liters of air per minute, but you see how much more efficient and economical the air that we are taking into our lungs. So as opposed to the individual who's breathing fast and shallow wearing the mask, they're breathing fast and shallow, but their breathing is so inefficient that they are losing 50% of the air, 50% of that air that they are taking into their body is not reaching the small air sacs in the lungs for gas exchange to take place. By simply reducing the respiratory rate, by breathing slower, by breathing deeper, and I'll go through it with you, we can increase our breathing to be so more efficient, 
from three liters to 5.1 liters. That's per minute. Now, what improvement would that have on blood oxygen saturation? So I'm just going to do another, I want to show you another paper here. And just bear with me one second. So this is a study that was conducted with individuals at altitude and they were in severe hypoxia because obviously at altitude atmospheric pressure is reducing and um, they were exposing their, their body in terms of their blood oxygen saturation dropped down to 80%. So I'm just going to show you. <clears throat> so here in this example, and you will see the paper. So it's the effects the effects of slow, deep breathing at high altitude on oxygen saturation. Now, it's not just about high altitude because I've used this, these, these exercises with people with asthma, people with, chronic fatigue, um, people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, people with chronic heart failure. And I've seen changes in their blood oxygen saturation within a couple of minutes just by changing their breathing. So in this example here, you've got a group of climbers and uh, they're staying at 4,559 meters. And you see in study A that the individuals, their blood oxygen saturation was 80.2%, which is severe hypoxia. And by practicing reducing their breathing to six breaths per minute, it increased their blood oxygen saturation from 80% to 89%. That's mild hypoxia. And in study B, it increased their blood oxygen saturation from 81% to 88%. And that's also with six breaths per minute. Now, how might that be happening? Well, part of that is because of breathing becoming more efficient due to not so much air wasted in dead space. And I'm, I'm saying like, of course, when you're wearing a mask, you may experience a headache at the start because you are rebreathing carbon dioxide back into the lungs, increasing it in the blood. And carbon dioxide is a vasodilator. So blood flow to the brain, the carotid the arteries are dilating, blood flow increases, and this could bring on a headache. But again, don't worry about that because it's, if you just continue, it's like we advocate all of our runners to run with the mouth closed. Why? Because when you have your mouth closed, when you breathe through your nose during physical exercise and during nasal breathing, and also when you have the mask on, make sure you breathe through your nose. And the reason being is because it was shown back in 1988 that nasal breathing increases the PaO2 millimeters of mercury, the pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood by 10% just by nasal breathing. Nasal breathing protects the airways. So runners who are breathing through an open mouth typically breathe fast and shallow. It's reducing oxygen uptake in the blood. Um, in contrast, when you breathe through your nose, there's a resistance to your breathing to slow down your breathing, allowing gas exchange to take place from the lungs to the blood, but also allowing carbon dioxide increase in the blood. So my point here is that when runners first switch from mouth to nose breathing during physical exercise, at the start, it's difficult. But we have them continue to breathe through their nose during physical exercise. Their body adapts to the accumulation of carbon dioxide. The feeling of air hunger diminishes, takes a few weeks. However, when they adapt to doing their physical exercise with their mouth closed, their oxygen delivery to the tissues and, and working muscles, etc., is higher. The fraction of expired oxygen is reduced. They're better able to tolerate carbon dioxide. There's less trauma to the airways. It's just much more efficient, and their ventilation reduces during physical exercise. So anytime you're doing your physical exercise, keep your mouth closed. And this also will prepare your breathing that you will be able to tolerate wearing a mask better. Okay. The exercise in terms of improving alveolar ventilation, we looked at six breaths per minute. I like you to place your hands on either side of your lower ribs. So to place your hands on either side of your lower ribs. And literally what we are going to do is we're just going to time it to six breaths per minute to increase alveolar ventilation. So anytime that you're feeling air hunger, um, how do you breathe to make your breathing more efficient? So first of all, you're breathing through your nose. You have your hands on either side of your lower two ribs. And as you breathe in, I would like you to feel your lower ribs moving out, but you shouldn't hear your breathing. So we still want to have a balance between the biochemistry, the biomechanics, 
and the cadence of the breath. So as you breathe in, your lower ribs are gently moving out. And as you breathe out, your lower ribs are gently moving in. And as you breathe in, your lower ribs are gently moving out. And as you breathe out, your lower ribs are gently moving in. As you breathe in, your lower ribs are gently moving out. And as you breathe out, your lower ribs are gently moving in. Now what I would like you to do is to breathe in two, three, four, five, out two, three, four, five, in two, three, four, five, out two, three, four, five, in two, three, four, five, out two, three, four, five, in two, three, four, five, out two, three, four, five, in two, three, four, five, out two, three, four, five, in two, three, four, five, out two, three, four, five, in two, three, four, five, out two, three, four, five, in two, three, four, five, out two, three, four, five. I'd like you to continue with that, that as you breathe in, your ribs are gently moving out, and as you breathe out, your ribs are gently moving in. In other words, take fuller breaths, but less of them. But in the process, don't deliberately overbreed, because if you overbreed, you get rid of too much carbon dioxide. So it's a balance. Breathing is not just about the biomechanics. Breathing is not just about breathing deep, using greater amplitude of the diaphragm. It's a balance between the biochemistry, the biomechanics, and the cadence of the breath. Because remember, biochemistry is about don't breathe too much air. If you breathe too much air, you get rid of too much carbon dioxide, your blood vessels constrict. Many of you with a low bolt score, um, you have cold hands, you've got cold feet, you have brain fog. So when you gently slow down your breathing to the point of air hunger, you help to reduce your body's chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. And by the way, wearing the mask will do this as well. You know, if you're, if you're wearing the mask for periods of time throughout the day, the very fact that you're pooling carbon dioxide and rebreathing it back into the body, it will help to reduce your chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. The second aspect of breathing that we look at is the biomechanics. And that's with lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs. And the reason being is because also <clears throat> when you're breathing using the lower regions of the lungs, it's where the greatest concentration of blood is. If you're breathing fast and shallow through the mouth, you typically ventilate the upper regions of the lungs. For example, if you look down at your chest and if you take a breath through your mouth, you'll see that you activate the upper chest. Whereas when you're breathing through your nose, you're harnessing nasal nitric oxide. And by carrying nitric oxide from your nasal cavity, down your throat, trachea, into your lungs, nitric oxide helps to redistribute the blood throughout the lungs. And this has been shown to reduce chest infections. Now, by the way, nitric oxide is antiviral and antibacterial, and it's also a natural bronchodilator. And, you know, even from a defense point of view, um, it's really, really important. Use your nose to breathe in order to reduce the viral load. Take less air into your body. And if you're in crowded places, breathe less and even hold your breath. But also, if there's a family member infected, it's very important that they also use their nose to breathe. And, you know, you, one can argue is to use a mask to help prevent the transmission of water particles into the atmosphere. There is a 42% greater water loss breathing out through the mouth than the nose. And when something is transmitted via airborne, not via, but via water particles airborne, by breathing out through your nose, your nose traps moisture. And this doesn't just apply to COVID. A lot of elderly people in nursing homes typically breathe through an open mouth but open mouth breathing is causing them to be dehydrated because of the loss of moisture through the mouth. 
Many of you wake up with a dry mouth in the morning. And you know, you can even just test the loss of moisture through your nose versus your mouth. If you breathe on through your nose into your phone with your nose, you will see the halo of moisture left on your phone. Try it with your nose and then do a similar breath with your mouth. And you will see that the halo of breath and moisture left by mouth breathing is much more. Mouth breathing is contributing to dehydration. Even on a very simple level, chap lips are a sign and very common with mouth breathing. So, you know, I'll probably just draw it to a close, but in terms of, because um, I didn't want to keep you too long, but we also advocate breathing through the nose during sleep, and it's really, really vital. And I know researchers, they published a paper, it was published in Elsevier during the week, and I don't have time to, to find it at this moment, but they talked about the evidence of, I'm actually going to try and pull it up because I think it's a very good paper. We've been talking about the importance of nasal breathing since, you know, for, for the last 20 years or so. Um, and I'm just going to pull up this paper here one second. Well, just tell me because it, it's worth it's published in Science Direct. And, you know, it's about the importance of nose breathing, even to reduce, not just talking about COVID, just reducing the common cold influenza and um, your nose is the your first line of defense in terms of airborne viruses coming into the body so i'm just going to pull up this here and you see the title of it there if you see the paper could nasal nitric oxide help to mitigate the severity of covid19 and it's by virtue of when you're talking about reducing viral load you have to consider two things one is the do dose how much of a dose of the virus are you taking into your body? And the other is the duration. There's two things going together there. Your nose helps to reduce the dose by virtue that you're breathing less air coming into your body by virtue by breathing through your nose because during wakefulness, your nose imposes a resistance to your breathing that's two to three times that of the mouth. Now, nitric oxide is produced in the nasal cavity. It's not produced in the, in the mouth, in the oral cavity. And nitric oxide is antiviral and it's antibacterial. But I'm just going to bring it down here. They talk about the benefits of nasal nitric oxide and talking about nasal breathing here, filtering, humidifying, warming effects, nitric oxide in the airways, it's antimicrobial effects, mucus production, cilia movement, vasodilation, in other words, the blood vessels of the lungs open up, bronchodilation, the airways of the lungs open up, and also reduce SARS COVID viral load by breathing through your nose. So if you're in a crowded place for any, any length of time, make sure, keep your mouth closed and breathe little air. Don't breathe so much air, reduce the viral load. Now, interesting here is our anecdotal observations also suggest favoring nasal breathing during sleep by sealing the mouth with adhesive tape that it reduces the common cold. This phenomenon may be due to the filtration and humidifying effects of the nose on inhaled air and to increase nasal nitric oxide levels in the airways, which may decrease viral load during sleep and allow the immune system more time to mount an effective antiviral response. Um, so we're not saying that nasal breathing is going to stop COVID, but what we're saying is that it can reduce the load in terms of what you're taking into the body. Now, in terms of getting the mouth closed at night. We developed strips going back quite, well, a few months because we've been advocating nasal breathing and taping of the mouth during sleep for close on 20 years. There are a number of tapes that you can use and I'm gonna give you different options. Um, there is one tape by a dentist in Colorado called Dr. Frank Seaman and he has a tape called Lip Seal Tape. And then there's a tape then is our own tape and it surrounds the mouth, but it helps bring the lips together. So it's called Myo Tape. And basically, it's cotton elasticated. And I'm just stretching it around the mouth. And in terms of this here, it's the elastic tension by the tape, which is drawing the lips together. So it's bringing my lips together so that I'm breathing through my nose during sleep, but there's no risk. So for instance, if there was emergency, I can open my mouth, etc. But this is helping to maintain nasal breathing. 
And I would really encourage you to look at, you know, in terms of obstructive sleep apnea, in terms of snoring, um, the founding father of obstructive sleep apnea, Dr. Christian Gimelow, before he passed on last year, he spoke about the crucial importance of breathing through the nose during sleep in terms of reducing sleep disorder breathing. I, as a kid, because of having asthma, I always have a stuffy nose because when you have a problem with your lungs, it'll travel up. You know, it's a unified airway. And because of a stuffy nose, you are 1.8 times more likely to have sleep problems. So I had constant fatigue. My concentration was affected. Um, my dental health is impacted because if you're breathing through the mouth all the time, your mouth is dry. You're more prone to, uh, to, to bad breath, to dental cavities, to gum disease, etc. So we have to think of the nose. And if you look at the functions of the nose, so an anatomical model here, we have the nose, we have the lips. So you see the side profile of the face. And when you look at the function, if you breathe in through your mouth, your mouth has zero functions in terms of breathing. Because any air that you bring into your mouth, that air goes straight down your throat. And you look at the size of the nasal cavity here. Look at the amount of space in the skull occupied by the nose. Like we sometimes think that our nose is this, but this is only about 20% of the nose. You have, according to Dr. Morris Cottle, he was an American ENT back in the 1970s. And he said that the human nose is responsible for 30 functions in the human body, 30 functions. So I would say to everybody, you know, make it a constant habit of breathing through your nose. Be conscious of your breathing. Both during rest, do all of your physical exercise with your mouth closed. Initially, it's a little bit more difficult. But, you know, this is when the adaptations are taking place. And also be conscious of how to breathe to optimize ventilation, not to breathe fast and shallow. But mouth breathing is typically fast and shallow, and mouth breathing is more likely fight or flight. Whereas nose breathing slows down the breath, but also nose breathing is activating a greater amplitude of the diaphragm breathing muscle. And your diaphragm breathing muscle is not just for respiration, but it's also connected with the emotions. So it is true that when people say take a deep breath, the instruction is good. It's well intended. However, the interpretation is not good because when people are told to take a deep breath, they often take in a big breath. So I'm just going to answer, help answer if I can, any of your questions. Um, your question about, <clears throat> so just bear with me one second. So for rhinitis, we can show you how to help open up your nose with rhinitis. Um, and this will also work for hay fever, that this has been known since 1923, that if you hold your breath, you can open your nose, decongest your nose. Now I'm talking about reversible obstruction of the nose here, say hay fever example, not a deviated septum. But the wonderful thing about the human nose is the more you breathe through it, the better it works. Don't do this next exercise if you're pregnant or if you've, any got, if you've got serious medical conditions, don't do the next exercise. So to open up your nose, I'd like you to take a normal breath in and out through your nose. Pinch your nose with your fingers or just hold your breath if you don't want to pinch your nose. And hold your breath, but gently nod your head up and down as you hold your breath. And keep going until you feel a medium to strong air hunger. Then let go of your nose, breathe in through your nose, and then wait about 30 seconds to a minute and do it again. To open up your nose, you have to hold your breath for at least 30 seconds. Um, but some of you mightn't be able to hold your breath for 30 seconds, but with practice and reduced breathing and nasal breathing and breath holding, you can increase that. So I'm gonna wait 30 seconds and then we do it again. And you will have better use of your nose when your bowl score is 20 seconds. So anybody with hay fever, with nasal stuffiness, you will continue to have nasal stuffiness until you get your bowl score up to at least 20 seconds. Because at that point, your breathing now is becoming more normal minute ventilation, respiratory rate, diaphragmatic breathing, nasal breathing. And that's when your airways start to work better as well. To try that exercise again to open up your nose, Take a normal breath in through your nose, a normal breath out, pinch your nose, hold your nose, gently nod your head up and down. And it's not about holding your breath to the point of stress. That's why I say, 
kind of go easy with the first couple. And uh, when you get used to holding your breath, then hold your breath for a little bit longer until a medium to strong air hunger and then to let go. So I'm just going to look at, again, at questions. So normal, normal blood oxygen saturation is between 95 and 99%. And it's when your blood oxygen saturation drops below 91% that it would be considered hypoxemia, that you know, the fraction of your hemoglobin occupied by oxygen is reducing. Now, it takes a quite, quite a degree. I would be surprised if the mask dropped you down because even the mask that we use, you'd have to be running with this on. And this is a totally different, in terms of the restriction, um, this is totally different because this is deliberately designed to restrict your breathing. So even if you see your blood oxygen saturation dropping, don't be too worried about it because it could be due to the increase of, car it's actually likely due to the increase of carbon dioxide. And as I said, the right shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation of the Bohr effect. <clears throat> So any special kind of mask you recommend that will give me more mouth room, not too expensive. To be honest, which I don't know enough about different masks, Linda. There's so many different ones out on the market. To increase your bolt score, Karen, you'd have to practice slowing down your breathing, nasal breathing. And you're talking about doing 40 to 60 minutes a day. And that's including physical exercise. But also get your mouth closed during sleep because think about the biochemistry of what is slow breathing doing? Just in a nutshell, by reducing your breathing volume towards normal, you can influence your blood circulation. You can, can increase oxygen delivery to the tissues and organs. You can also help open up your airways. As some of you just have done, you've opened up your nose by simply holding the breath. The biomechanics is all about the relationship. You need your diaphragm for stabilization of the spine. So individuals with lower back pain, for example, often have dysfunctional breathing. So when you're breathing low with lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs, you're increasing oxygen uptake by virtue that you're taking the air deeper into the lungs where the greatest concentration of blood is. You are also getting the benefits of diaphragmatic amplitude, which is very important for sleep apnea. And the reason being is because when you breathe low with lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs, it increases lung volume and when there's an increase to lung volume, there's a dilation of the upper airway. In other words, the throat becomes stiffer and less likely to collapse. So the worst thing that we could do with sleep, especially if we are pros to sleep, up, if, the worst thing that we could do during sleep, especially if we are exposed to obstructive sleep apnea, is to mouth breathe. Because mouth breathing is narrowing the architecture of the upper airway. We're more prone to drying it out, causing inflammation of the upper airway. The airway is more liable to collapse. Mouth breathing is fast, shallow breathing. This in turn reduces lung volume. And um, so, you know, and even if you, and I, I won't really go into it now because there's a huge connection between your breathing and your sleep, whether it's insomnia, whether it's snoring, whether it's obstructive sleep apnea. So rhinitis, I choke at night and I've gone into seizures due to oxygen falling. It's really, you need a sleep study done um, in terms of, Fibromyalgia is also related to obstructive sleep apnea. So if an individual is snoring and then they stop breathing and they stop breathing due to collapse of the upper airways. So here, for example, the soft palate might fall in against the, the airway or the tongue falls into the throat or the epiglottis falls into the throat or you have collapse of the throat itself. But it's really vital to breathe through your nose with your tongue resting in the roof of the mouth because your tongue has got two places to be. It's either in the roof of your mouth or it's falling into your throat. And to determine where your tongue should be, you could do this sound. So in order to make that sound, you need to have your tongue resting in the roof of the mouth. And when you wake up in the morning, you should wake up with your lips together and your tongue resting in the roof of the mouth. You shouldn't wake up with your lips apart, with your mouth dry, and because in order to breathe through the mouth, you have to lower your tongue resting posture. And when the tongue is midway or, or low on, in the mouth, when the tongue is midway or low in the mouth, it's more likely to fall into the throat to reduce airway size. And of course, as well, you have the mandible falling back into the airway. So for sleep, light, slow, and deep breathing. 
I'm just going through maybe a couple of the questions here. Um, it saved me when I had active COVID. I still have symptoms 12 weeks later. So Mary Ann, what I would say to you is continue, you know, working to get your both score up and do everything very, very gentle. Um, we don't, I don't agree with some of the forced breathing exercises. <clears throat> You'll see them online that were sometimes um, advocated for COVID. And the reason being is because it puts a stress on the ribs and on the lungs. Um, we want to try and get bronchodilation, but we want to do it by gently working with the breath itself. And nasal breathing is really, really a key part of it, but it's not just enough about breathing through the nose. It's also about breathing lighter, and it's also about breathing deep. And that other thing about cadence breathing to six breaths per minute, it increases what's called heart rate variability. And heart rate variability is a measure of vagal tone. And individuals who are unwell, either emotionally or physically, they typically have reduced heart rate variability. But that's a whole nother kind of ball game. Um, but that's why I would say to you, the six breaths per minute is not just about improving alveolar ventilation. It's also about stimulating the vagus nerve. So from Jen, I'm a fitness instructor, preach nasal breathing. Thank you, Jen. I had a client contract COVID and she credits her nasal breathing for the short duration and her recovery. We have had doctors who are saying the same. Um, some of our doctors who have been incorporating this into the practices. So Robin Rottenberg's book, who I know, <clears throat> and she's a long-term yoga instructor. So she wrote a book called Restoring Prana. And <clears throat> very interesting because when she went to the ancient yoga sutras, they didn't talk about taking big breaths and full breaths. They actually spoke about breathing subtle and about breathing light. So Dom is breathing more slowly automatically going to make people, it can do, if you reduce the respiratory rate, it's normal that the tidal volume or the size of the breath can increase. However, just to make sure that it doesn't increase disproportionately. The name of the individual who I was talking to, um, about breathing was Dr. Luciano Bernardi. So he's an Italian cardiologist, but if you put his name into PubMed, you will, you will see his work. Um, as a doctor, we have to wear the N95 masks, which I believe are quite restrictive. The effort is too much. So I think in terms of that, it's going to be the same instance. It's about increasing bolt score, reducing chemo sensitivity to carbon dioxide. I understand that the effect of wearing the mask is going to vary person to person, depending on your breathing pattern. But those individuals with a lower bolt score, they are going to have a harder time wearing a mask for a prolonged period of time because of an increased sensitivity to carbon dioxide. And the whole purpose of changing your everyday breathing and breathing through your nose during sleep and rest and physical exercise is to reduce the chemo sensitivity of the body to carbon dioxide. And from Nancy, hi, I know Nancy Rothstein is the sleep ambassador going back a long time. And I'm sure Nancy will be, um, will be in agreement about the importance of nasal breathing during sleep. So, so yeah, so I'm going to kind of leave it at that. And I would say thanks very much on this. You are going to hear more about breathing as time goes on. There's a book currently at the moment. It's destined to be a bestseller. It's not my book. I'm writing another book. Um, but there's a book by James Nestor called Brett, and it's currently one of the best-selling books on Amazon at the moment. And it's talking about the stuff that we've been talking about for 20 years. So finally, simple breathing strategies are getting out there, which is great. So listen, thanks very much um, for staying with us. I intended, of course, talking for 30 minutes, and it's now 53 minutes, but you know what? That's just the way it goes. And the best of luck, everybody and take care bye by thank the way you. just in thank final you. note we will put this up onto youtube so you'll find it either on oxygen advantage channels or on biotech clinic bye bye